So, those coverings are spoken about by Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, mode of ignorance. Uh, it is a very heavy covering. Mode of passion, slightly less. Mode of goodness, slightly less. So, Srila Prabhupada, he expressed at that time, he said, because they're so heavily covered, I don't know how it will be possible for them to understand your message, meaning this Srimad Bhagavatam. But then he said, but actually, you yourself have told how it will be possible in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then Srila Prabhupada quoted five verses from the second chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, those chapters, those five verses, they described how the power of Krishna Kata can actually make possible the impossible. Because hmm? Prabhupada is saying, I don't know how it would be possible, but you said it will be possible if they hear your message. If they hear. So then he quoted this verse, Shrinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hridyantak sto hyabhadrani vidhunoti suhrit satam. Krishna is now being described by Sutta Goswami. Hmm? Krishna is being described as the suhrit. That means the well wishing friend. You see? Well wishing friend. Suhrit. There are different types of friends, you know. We all experience in our life. Sometimes we say fair weather friends, that they're there when things are good, but when you have some problem, bye bye, fair weather friends, acquaintances, different levels of friends, family members, so forth. But sometimes you have an actual intimate friend who really cares about you who cares about your well-being, huh? who's very, very concerned for you. And therefore, they're always wishing your welfare. And they're trying to show their friendship to you in every way that they can, you see. So this, in Sanskrit language, this is called suhrit. And the word hrit means heart. And su means like special or, or extraordinary. Huh? So, Srila Gurudev used the term bosom friend in English. Bosom friend. Because bosom means your heart. And that person who always his heart is embracing your heart they're called bosom friend or suhrit. So Krishna is being called suhrit satam. Now what does satam mean? The pure devotees or the sincere bhaktas who have begun the process of bhakti because they have now come to the association of the pure Vaishnavas in which they can hear the message of Krishna, Krishna Kata. So now, here in this verse, it is telling Shrinvatam, meaning hearing Shrinvatam Svakata Krishna. Here, Krishna's Kata, the topics, Kata means topics, about Krishna are called Svakata his own kata. And it also means himself. Meaning, it is himself. The kata about Krishna is absolute and it is non-different than himself. 
Svakata Krishna. And someone who hears this, it is called Punya Shravana Kirtanam. That assembly wherein these topics are being heard, these topics are being chanted and discussed. Shravanam Kirtanam. This is called Punya. Very exalted, very pure, very transcendental. Punya. So now, when that is going on, Krishna is watching from where? What I told yesterday. He's inside your heart. Hridi Antaksto. He's situated in your heart. Huh? And I'm, we're not just saying that. Krishna himself <laughs> says that. In the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm? He says... Yes. Sarvasya chaham hridi sannivishto matakshmritir jnanam apohanam cha. I am seated within everyone's heart, and it is from me that all knowledge, all remembrance, and all forgetfulness, it is coming. You see. And then he says, Vedaischa sarvayar aham eva vedya. That means all of the Vedic knowledge is to know me. Vedanta krid, Vedavid. I am the person who's given the Vedas. I'm the compiler of the Vedas, Vedanta Krit. Even the end, all the conclusions of all Vedic knowledge, it is me. And Vedavid, I'm the one who knows all the Vedas, all the knowledge. So, Krishna is there in the heart, and he has been waiting a very long time. He can wait forever, uh, and it's practically forever because we're called Nityabhadha. And Nityabhadha means eternally, you know, conditioned souls. So Krishna's been there waiting. And it's even described in the Vedas, in the Upanishads, there's a particular slok, which describes that Krishna is situated next to the conditioned soul in our heart, and he's compared to two birds that are sitting together, side by side, on the branch of a tree. Hmm? But one bird is very preoccupied with trying to eat the fruits on the tree. So that one eating bird does not see that right sitting right next to him is his dear, very dear most friend, his companion bird because he's so preoccupied he doesn't even notice that he's sitting right next to him. But when he somehow or other turns his face and sees, oh, my friend is here, then their relationship begins. So this is the well-wishing friend Krishna who is within our heart and he's waiting for us to begin the process of bhakti by hearing about him. And when that bhakti process of Krishna Kata, hearing Krishna Kata, when it begins, then what does Krishna do? It's so amazing, this verse. As the well-wishing friend, Krishna begins the process of cleaning your heart. Hmm? Uh, so this means cleaning, vidunoti. Uh, he begins to, sometimes Gurudev used the word brooming, with a broom, sweeping. What is he cleaning from your heart? He's cleaning the things that are the impediments for you to come to him. They're called anartas. And they're also known as Abhadra. Abhadra means very inauspicious things. Inauspicious. What is in the meaning of inauspicious? That you're going farther away from Krishna. That's all. Auspicious means you're coming closer to Krishna and inauspicious means you're going farther away. That is the sum and substance of the word inauspicious. You see. 
So those impediments that are there in the heart, Prabhupada also describes them in his translation as unwanted things because they're not artas. Artas are things that you need that are beneficial for you. Artas. But unartas means they're unbeneficial. They cause harm. And harm means you forget Krishna. So the problem that all the conditioned souls have in the material world, and that was envisioned by Srila Vyasadeva, uh, when he heard from Narada Muni, the whole message of Srimad Bhagavatam and was inspired by him to write and, and completely expand the Srimad Bhagavatam within this world. Then he went into a trance of samadhi. Uh, and in that trance of samadhi, he saw the Supreme Lord himself and he saw his energy. He saw my potency behind him, standing behind him. And then he saw that the jivas, uh, they cannot approach that Supreme because of anartas. Anarta upasamam sakshat. Uh, Bhakti Yoga Madhoksaje. Only by the process of Bhakti Yoga can these anartas be eliminated. So Vyasadeva realized that. Huh? But he also knew Lokasya Ajanato Vidvams. That the general mass of people, all the conditioned souls in this world, they don't know this. They don't know that there are these anartas preventing them from coming to the Lord and that the process of bhakti yoga will eliminate these anartas. So therefore, what did he do out of great compassion? Chakri, Chakri Sattvata Samhitam. He produced, he wrote this Sattvata Samhitam, this great Srimad Bhagavatam, with the final fruit of all Vedic knowledge. And there will be nothing superfluous in the Srimad Bhagavatam, nothing. Huh? What is that second verse again? Dharma Projita Kaitava. Uh, to introduce the Bhagavatam, then it is telling there that Dharma Projita Kaitava Triparamo Nirmat Saranam Satam. The Srimad Bhagavatam is not going to have any cheating Dharma. Cheating Dharma. Kaitava. Kaitava means cheating. Now, why is he mentioning that there is a thing called cheating dharma? Because I thought that dharma means your, uh, your specific religious duties, your, your dharma, right? If you ask people in the Western world now, they know this word. They've heard the word dharma. But they have no idea, actually, what is the meaning of dharma. But there is a type of dharma called koitava dharma, which means cheating dharma. And where do you find this cheating dharma? Where? In the Vedas. Where? Where in the Vedas? Kamakanda. Yeah? Any other places? In other religions also. No, but I mean in the Vedas. Karmakanda. Yankanda. Yes. Upasanakanda? Yes. To tell everyone, in the Vedas, there are divisions, like we're saying, karma kanda, those who want to achieve happiness within the material world, or even the upper planetary system, Svargalok and so forth, they're facilitated in the karma kanda section of the Vedas. That if you want to have these material desires fulfilled, okay. The, the Vedic literatures are like a wish-fulfilling tree. You can have your desires fulfilled. And here's the way. You worship this demigod if you want this. You worship this other demigod if you want that. Huh? And you can even go to the heavenly planets and stay there for millions of years. But guess what? You're going to get cheated in the end. Why? Yeah, because it's not permanent. And because it doesn't actually fulfill what your soul really needs. That was one of the main questions of the sages uh, to Sutta Goswami. How can the Atma be completely satisfied? Atma sam prasidati. 
So this Srimad Bhagavatam is not dealing with the body, with the mind, even with one's illusory sentimental attachments of the material world. There will be nothing of a cheating category in the Srimad Bhagavatam because why? Because now Vyasadeva is going to complete all the Vedas. It will be the final installment, Srimad Bhagavatam. The final commentary on the end of all Vedic knowledge called Vedanta Sutra, Srimad Bhagavatam. You see? So that cheating Dharma is not going to be there. Why? Because Krishna is your friend and he's not going to cheat you now. Uh, he allows, the Paramatma allows for the conditioned soul to fulfill their desires and to cheat themselves. That's allowed. But now, at the very end, Krishna has come to this world. He has not come to cheat anyone. He has come to deliver all the living beings who hear his message. And therefore, when uh, Krishna sees that a, now a person is hearing my message, he's hearing about me, he becomes very favorably disposed, and now he begins the process of cleaning your heart and removing all the anartas. Now, how does that help us? The next verse tells us there's a, a very nice progression. You know, whenever Srila Gurudev would begin his festivals, and most of his festivals were um, on the subject of the Srimad Bhagavatam, he would deliver a whole presentation of the Bhagavatam tailored for that particular audience. But he would always have this introductory part. And he always mercifully would call on me when it came time to tell these five verses. And the reason why he did that is because I memorized those five verses from Prabhupada's prayer that, that I'm talking about, you know. And I liked them so much. They encouraged me so much in my spiritual life, actually. They had a very personal impact on me. And the first time that I came to Braj Mandala Parikrama, uh, in 1994 with Gurudev, that was the first time I also celebrated Srila Prabhupada's um, disappearance day, yeah, his Tirubhav. In, and we were in Rup Sanatan and we were sitting, just a small little assembly of us with Gurudev, just the Western devotees, in the Seva Kunj, up on the first floor of the temple there. And then, you know, it was actually probably one of the first times that I also spoke in front of Gurudev, actually. He called me because we were disciples of Prabhupada, few of us, and so called me to speak something. So I spoke, and, um, and I became inspired, because I also went to Srila Prabhupada's room that morning at Radha Damodar Temple, and I was praying to him. And then um, when I spoke, I became inspired to, to quote those five verses. And Gurudev's eyes were like, oh, <laughs> you know shlokas. <laughs> And especially these slokas, you see. So then, uh, after, afterwards, I came in to see Gurudev in his room at some point that day or the next day. And he says, oh, you spoke very good yesterday. I like that you are quoting these slokas. Very good, very good. So then when Gurudev began touring in the West, and he began to speak the Srimad Bhagavatam, you know, like each of us had a particular little role to play. Right? We were like his entourage. So, Nemi Maharaj was the minstrel. <laughs> and he played the violin. And he had, you know, a particular way of singing Nama Om Vishnu Padaya and like that. And so he became a mainstay, you know, always. Gurudev would call on him before every single, even during the Kartik Parikrama, he would always call on him. So he had his role to play. So each one of us had our little role to play. And we tried to do it as good as we could each time, you know, to please Gurudev. So, uh, so anyway, those, those five verses, they meant a lot to me. Uh, because even before I came to Gurudev, they helped my spiritual life so much. You know, because what they're really talking about, those five verses, is how in the world am I going to be able to become a devotee? This is so high. 
this love of Krishna, Krishna Prem. And there's so many stages, and I'm so unqualified, and uh, I can very easily see where I'm uh, inadequate and unqualified. So, you know, at a certain point in, in a devotee's spiritual life, they may see this and they may feel some, even some discouragement. Like, how can I become like this? But those five verses, Srila Prabhupada told from the Bhagavatam, and I read those, and then I studied the purports, and I read that, and then I said, okay, I just have to continue hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, hearing the message of Krishna's, being in the association of the Vaishnavas, and especially hearing from the pure Vaishnavas, and then this should take place, because it's guaranteed in the Bhagavatam. And I saw a little bit of progress, not that much, but a little bit of progress. So it gave me hope, you see. And actually, this is the process. This is the entire process here about Krishna, from the lips of the pure Vaishnava. And the more exalted the Vaishnava, the more essential it is to hear from him. And why is that? Because he has realized this knowledge. That is actually the definition of real Sadguru. He's realized this knowledge. And he's realized Krishna. Uh, the very most important verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam for telling the qualities of Guru uh, is in the, in the 11th canto. Uh, Tasmat Guru Prapadyeta Jigyasu Shreya Uttama. Shabdi Parecha Nishnatam Brahmani Upasamashraya. Here it is told that because there's a subject matter being discussed and then this verse completes that subject matter. He says, Tasmat Guru Prapadyeta. That means, therefore, now you should approach Guru. And you have to do Prapadya. Prapadya means surrender. You must surrender. How can you surrender to someone unless you have faith that, first of all, that person has what you don't have. That person, uh, he holds the key in his hand to giving you the greatest benefit. So therefore the Srimad Bhagavatam is telling the, quality, the qualities and qualifications of that person. So you should approach that person. Jigyasu Shreya Uttamam. And you should inquire from that person what is your what? Topmost Shreya benefit. Not inquire from Guru, how can I be happy in the material world, oh Guru Dev? How can I get money? How can I, my wife, my husband, uh, be happy with me? Oh, my wife has left me, my husband has left me, oh, I'm crying and weeping. This is not what you approach Guru for. You approach Guru for Shreya Uttamam. Topmost benefit of your soul. And what is that? Only Krishna Prem. So Sadguru is only for that. He is not going to cheat you. But if you want to be cheated, then Srila Gorgavinda Maharaj has a very nice explanation how Guru will also cheat you if that's your intention and your motive. What did he call it? Vanchana and Kripana. Right? Vanchana means cheating. Why will Guru cheat? Because the disciple at that point in time, he can't hear the Guru. He can't hear. He's completely in a fog. His whole mind is bewildered. So many material desires. Uh, and therefore, Guru cannot give him directly. Hmm? He cannot hear uh, what the Guru actually wants to inject into the heart. So, for the time being, the Guru 
will give something else. That is called Vanchana. Gorgovind Maharaj explained this. You see. But when the disciple comes in the real way, and he does exactly what Krishna has told in the Bhagavad Gita, to approach a self-realized soul and surrender to him. Tadvidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya. You hear from him and inquire from him very submissively. And you must serve selflessly without selfish interest. You serve that personality. Because if you want to learn how to serve Krishna, you can't have any motivation except his benefit. That's called uttama bhakti, right? That is called pure bhakti. Pure bhakti. And you will never reach Krishna unless you render pure bhakti to him. Because if it's adulterated or mixed with anything else, you'll get a different result. But if it's pure, then you will progress very rapidly from Shraddha all the way up through Nishta, Ruchi, Asakti, Bhav, Prem. It will come if you do pure bhakti. That's why our Gurudev, every single festival, he would quote the definition verse, what is the definition of pure bhakti? Huh? So everyone can say it together. Anya vilashita yam jnana karmadi anavritam anakulyena krishnanam shilanam bhaktir uttama. So now I'm going to do what Gurudev always did. <laughs> he called on one of us to stand and tell what is the meaning of this verse. So everyone is like, oh, not me, not me. <laughs> That's how we used to feel sometimes in front of Gurudev. <laughs> Just kind of like, oh, 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 he called on me. Oh, I have to stand up, okay. Oh my God, Timirandasya, your hand is shaking. In the very beginning, we didn't exactly know what Guru, when he first came to the West, what he wanted to hear from us. So, <laughs> I'll tell one story. Brajanath will remember this. Um, it was... Uh, Lord Nityananda's appearance day, we were in Malaysia. I think it was the second time we came to Malaysia. And uh, Gurudev called on me to stand up and talk about Lord Nityananda. So, when you stood up in front of Gurudev, in front of the entire audience, where there was at least, you know, a couple hundred people minimum, depending on the size of the venue. So now you're on the, uh, well, they used to call it the hot seat in Gorgovinda Maharaj's time, but this was the hot stand in front of Gurudev. So I began to try to speak, and I, I think I was telling the story of Jagai and Madhai, right? And some other things, how Lord Nityananda was merciful to Jagai and Madhai. But practically at the end of every first or second sentence, Srila Gurudev would stop me. And he would say, ah, not like that, like this. He'd correct me. And then again, I'd start speaking a few sentences. And again, he'd stop me. And the devotees in the audience were watching this. <laughs> and they started to uh, chuckle quite a bit, you know, until it actually almost turned into laughter. Because Gurudev was intentionally doing this. When he would intentionally do this to someone, what was he doing? He was cutting away your false ego. I am such and such. I know so much like this. So Gurudev, he, like Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur says, the sadhu, he holds the sacrificial sword and the disciple his false ego is like the sacrificial animal whose head is on the chopping block. And uh, he lowers the sword, uh, which is actually the form of unkind words. That's the term that he uses. Unkind words. Because generally you try to be very kind and, you know, not to upset someone. Not... But when Guru wants to attack your false ego, then it's time for serious surgery. And he doesn't give you an anesthetic at that time. 
It's open heart surgery. So Srila Gurudev did that to us many times, again and again. And when I finally sat down, it was as if I had gone one round in a boxing ring with, uh, you know, like Mike Tyson or some world heavyweight champion. And I had been thoroughly pummeled. And that was it. No mas. <laughs> so, so how did I get to that point? I forgot. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, I forgot the train. Having someone speak on Pure um, Bhakti. Your Bhakti. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's right. So now I'm going to call on uh, Krishna Chandra Prabhu to tell the meaning of this verse. I know that he's a very, very capable preacher. This, this definition verse of pure bhakti, uttama bhakti. <clears throat> Actually, here, I should give him the mic. Beautiful. 
<clears throat> but one movement and the boat would flip. And at that moment the Sadhu took his kamandalu and put all the water out of the boat. So now they're safe again and they looked, the students looked at the Sadhu. What kind of person is he? And they asked for explanation and he said it's very simple. Just before it looked like the Lord wanted us to drown. So I thought I will help him. <laughs> so now it looks like, oh, he doesn't want that we drown. I also help him. I have no consideration for me. I have only a consideration for acting according to his pleasure. So this uninterrupted fascination of the heart, an inclination, which is not buddhi purvaka, which is not just um, instigated by one's own intelligent and um, inner discipline that one should do it, but it's just a natural fascination of the heart. This is called Uttama Bhakti. Should I give Gurudev score? No. Actually, you made the mistake that I made in front of Gurudev. Uh, one of the first times that he asked me to explain this verse. And I started with, I started with the Tatastalaksha. Right? And Gurudev said, no. What are you doing? You cannot explain what is... First you explain what is the Swarup Laksha. What is Bhakti? Then after that you explain what is not Bhakti. What are the impediments to this Uttama Bhakti? You see. So of course, you did very well. Thank you so much, Prabhu. And, um, but to understand, actually, Srila, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has written a very beautiful explanation in his book that our Gurudev has given to the whole world, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu, his commentary on Rupa Goswami's book, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And, uh, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he's also written extensively in Jaiva Dharma and, and various other places, Bhakti Tattva Viveka, to study this verse and the actual definition of Bhakti. Because if we don't know what Bhakti is, then how are we going to practice it? We'll think that we're doing Bhakti. And this is actually one of the biggest problems uh, within even Vaishnava institutions that there's a misconception right, and a misunderstanding of what actually constitutes pure devotion, pure bhakti to Krishna. So there are different definitions, Gurudev used to point this out, in different shastras, even in Srimad Bhagavatam, very nice verses are there describing pure bhakti. But Rupa Goswami, he wrote this special verse in, in which nothing is left out, Nothing is superfluous. Everything is there in one single verse. Therefore, when one makes a proper study of the composition of that verse, word by word, even syllable by syllable, then only can you fully, fully understand what is uh, uttama bhakti, pure bhakti. And just to give you an example, if we say, that pure bhakti is the natural, as you were saying, the natural inclination of the heart to make Krishna happy, right? To give happiness to Krishna. Well, but there's a problem here because Krishna becomes very happy even when he's killing the demons or when he's like, for example, wrestling with the big wrestlers who wanted to kill him in Kamsa's wrestling arena. They were giving him pleasure. He was very happy to wrestle because the cowherd boys always wrestle and uh, Krishna likes to taste vira ras, the rasa of chivalry. Uh, so, can we say that those wrestlers are doing uttama bhakti because their whole inclination is to kill Krishna. But, but by doing their wrestling, they're giving Krishna happiness. Are they doing bhakti? No. So therefore, it doesn't fall into that category. So what Gurudev explained was Anukulyena Krishna Anushilanam. So the word Anukul is very important here because Anukul means it is favorable. For what? 
for Krishna's benefit. Even Mother Yashoda sometimes displeases Krishna because we know in the story of the uh, when she the Damodar Lila story and she was stirring the pot of milk uh, on the stove and then Krishna woke up and came and was crying and pulling on her sari and then she put him on her, her lap covered his head and gave her her breast milk and Krishna was very very happy drinking her breast milk uh, but I won't go into the details of this story, so many details. The, the milk on the stove wanted to commit suicide because the milk did So there's no opportunity to ever serve Krishna now because those that milk was going to be for Krishna's benefit. She was making milk sweets to give to Krishna. So, But when the milk began to boil over, she suddenly pulled Krishna off, put him down, and went to rush to the milk to save the milk. And Krishna became angry. Like little children become angry, right? When they don't get what they want. And he wanted to continue drinking Mother Yashoda's breast milk. So, but was Mother Yashoda doing Uttama Bhakti? Yes. Huh? Because she was displeasing Krishna. How was she doing Uttama Bhakti? Krishna's benefit. Yeah. Everything she does is for his benefit. Every breath she takes is for his benefit. Even her life errors, like we heard today, never heard that before, what Sri Dhani Maharaj told this morning, that she distributes her life errors to go out into the forest amongst the cows to watch over Krishna. This is Mother Yashoda, all-pervading motherhood, you see. So, uh, anyway, if you want to know Guru Tattva, you must understand what is this verse. Uttama Bhakti. And that's why it's listed in the very beginning of our Shlokamrita in the section of Guru Tattva. The very verse is listed there. Because Sri Guru is only doing pure bhakti. Uttama Bhakti. And he's only come to teach that to his disciples. You see? So therefore Bhagavatam is saying that Guru has to have three qualifications. What is that? Shabdi Pari Chanishnatam Brahmani. These are the first two qualifications. Shabda Brahma, he must be fully acquainted, nishnatalized, the transcendental sound vibration of all Vedic knowledge. Yeah? It must be completely realized within his heart. Uh, Shabda Brahma. And uh, Parabrahma. Shabde Parecha Nishnatam Brahmani. Pare Brahmani. That means Parabrahma. Parabrahma is Krishna himself. So Sri Guru, real Guru, must have practical realization of Krishna. Some experience they must have. Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridharmars is going to explain about this. We'll hear his own words explaining about this. How Sri Guru must definitely have some direct some connection internally with that Parabrahma, Krishna. And then the third qualification, Upasamashrayam. That means he is completely detached from anything mundane within the material world. He has no interest in mundane sense enjoyment. Selfish interest separate from Krishna. He is merged 24 hours daily in the process of pure devotion to Krishna, which is Anya Bilashita Shunyam. Completely devoid of any other material desires, any other desires except to give benefit to Krishna. That's all. And as he told, uh, he's not even trying to obtain liberation from the process of birth and death, you see. Uh, this cycle of birth and death, which is horrible, which all living beings want to avoid. But the pure Vaishnava, he's prepared to stay here. If Krishna's desire is that, he's prepared, but he has only one demand. Uh, what is that? Mama Janmani Janmani Shvare Bhavatad Bhaktir. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself spoke these words. That even 
I don't want to avoid taking rebirth in this world. Mama Janmani Janmani. In my repeated births within this world, I will take those births, but I want from you only one thing. Bhavatad Bhaktir Ahoytuki Twai. That I will have completely pure, unmotivated bhakti to you, my Lord. You can place me anywhere. You can make me Lord Brahma. You can make me an ant, an insect. Anywhere. But I want, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, that I'll take birth in the house of your devotee. That's my only requirement. He does not want to be separated from the service of the Lord. Pure service. And guess what? Whether one is in heaven, in the heavenly planets, enjoying like Nala Kuvar, Mani Griva, all kinds of sense enjoyment like we heard this morning, or whether someone goes down to the most hellish regions, if they are purely serving Krishna, they are happy in their heart. Srila Gurudev said, it is impossible to do real bhakti and not be happy. It's not possible to not be happy if you're doing real bhakti. So therefore you should, all of us, myself included, should analyze that when you start feeling some unhappiness about something, guess what? You're not doing pure devotion to Krishna. This is the symptom. Because if someone is serving Krishna fully surrendered, full sharanagati, then he sees, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, I see only happiness in all directions. Huh? And even the suffering in your service, my Lord, or happiness, doesn't matter. They're the same. Why? Because both of them have the same effect. If I suffer for you, my Lord, in your service, or if I accept the enjoyment that you give me in your service, not for me, then what happens? Avidya. Ignorance, which is causing all problems in the material world, avidya, it becomes destroyed. You see? So you can only win, you can only be victorious through surrender. And you are a loser if you don't surrender. And when you finally understand this, when it really becomes clear, then you give up. Right? Huh? But you stop fighting the battle. The battle to be independent of Krishna. The battle to try to get your own enjoyment separately from Krishna. Huh? And you're fighting against who? Maya Devi. She's Krishna's insurmountable material energy. You can't surpass her. Huh? But Krishna says, my divine energy called Maya is Duratyaya, impossible to cross over. No one with their mystic powers, no one with their physical ability, with their mental and intellectual ability, nothing can cross over Maya because it's Krishna's divine potency. But Krishna says, Mam eva ye prapadyante. Mayam etam tarantite. Anyone that surrenders to me, whoosh, they cross beyond it so easily. Even in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's compared to shrinking down an entire ocean, which is not possible to cross, into the size of a, of a little puddle in the mud made by the hoof print of a calf. Very tiny. Very easy to step across. That's what happens when someone takes shelter of Krishna's pure devotee and takes shelter of the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. Then the whole material existence becomes shrunk down to that. So this is the difference between a very neophyte devotee called Kanishta, and there are many levels of Kanishta, and then the next level, Madhyam, the intermediate devotee. But this is the main difference, because in the lower levels, the devotee still has so many different anartas, and still so much illusion, you see? 
But if that, inter if that lower devotee, he continues to execute the process of bhakti in the association of the pure Vaishnavas and always hearing, chanting about Krishna, then Srinvatam Svakata Krishna, all the anartas become destroyed within the heart and then the modes of material nature which are causing guess what the modes of nature are causing tada rajasta mo bhava kama lobha dayas they cause lust kam they cause <coughs> lobha greed envy illusion all of these unwanted effects are caused by these lower modes of nature meaning tamagun and rajagun and when your heart begins to be cleansed from the anartas, then the effect of this, cheta etaira na vidham, huh? that means that your cheta, your heart, becomes aloof, disconnected from those effects. And stitam sattve prasiditi. Now that devotee becomes situated in very special position in the material world called sattva, where he's mostly in mode of goodness, very unaffected by the lower modes of material nature, you see? And proceed a tea, he becomes very satisfied. This is only the beginning stages of pure bhakti, of even attempting to do pure bhakti. And here's one encouraging thing, that even if we're not in this category, that we are free from material desires and all of that, don't worry, because the Srimad Bhagavatam is also telling Akama sarva kamo va, moksha kamo udara di, tivrena, bhakti yogena, yajeta purusham param. Uh, uh, I think it's Sukadeva Goswami in the second Sorry. canto. Yes. Just when he begins his discourse, he mentions this. He says, Look, my dear king, uh, there are many worshippers of demigods. There are many persons who want to have impersonal liberation. There are persons who want to attain freedom from the material existence. And there are also some persons who are free from material desires, like the pure devotees. But guess what? All of them, they should all do the same thing. Akama, without material desires, sarvakama, even if you have all material desires, just imagine, if you had every single, you're overwhelmed by every single possible material desire, sarvakama, or you are like the impersonalists, or you want moksha, you want liberation, but if you're intelligent, udharadi, then what? Tivrena bhakti yogena, jajeta purushamparam, you should worship the Supreme Person, Purushamparam, Bhagavan, Sri Krishna, with what? Bhakti Yoga, Tivrena Bhakti Yogena, very unflinching devotion, because that alone will, you will gain everything from that, and all problems will be solved. So even if you have all material desires, Krishna will find a way, if you want to worship Him, that's also discussed by Lord Chaitanya to Sanatan Goswami and the Chaitanya Charitamrita, how, I won't go into it because our time is coming now, but how Krishna does something very special for the devotees who come to him, unlike the demigods. If you worship the demigods, oh, they don't care about your real well-being. They're just going to give you what you want, even if it's bad for you which most of the time it is, like we heard this morning, like wealth, too much wealth, become illusioned. So uh, the worship of Krishna is different because he's your well-wishing friend. So Lord Chaitanya says when he sees that a devotee is coming to, to Krishna, oh, Krishna's look, he's watching, oh, my devotee, he's coming to me, but he wants from me so many material desires to be fulfilled. So he's very foolish, but I'm not foolish. I'm very intelligent. This is how Krishna is expressing himself through Mahaprabhu. He says, I'm not foolish. I'm very intelligent. So what I will do is I will fulfill that devotee's material desires, but in such a way that he will no longer have those material desires, you see. 
Uh, and that also means that Krishna will put you through many tests, many frustrations, uh, and you'll have to go through the fire of ordeal. This is how Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati explains it. The fire of ordeal. So that, but that fire is very purifying. The Mayak Samsara Dava fire, that's not very desirable. Uh, but Sri Guru, he comes to the conditioned souls who are burning in the blazing fire of material existence, birth after birth after birth, uh, and they find no way to get out of this blazing forest fire, but Sri Guru comes like a cloud. Just like a big, huge mass of rain clouds comes in the sky. Where did the clouds get the water? They got it from the ocean. And Krishna is that ocean of mercy. And Sri Guru is like the cloud that takes that from the ocean of mercy and then comes over the land and comes directly over the forest fire and pours down gushing torrents of rain and <laughs> extinguishes the forest fire of material existence. This is Sri Guru. Bande Guru Sri Charanad. This is how Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has described the first verse of Gurvastakam, the qualities of Sri Guru, that he is that agent of Krishna to end the suffering and the difficulties of the conditioned souls in this material world. And those who come to him are very, very fortunate. But they're also foolish in many cases. So Krishna has a way of making them intelligent by hearing Harikatha from the pure Vaishnava, by serving the pure devotees, uh, and by following their instructions, in the, his instructions in their lives, and then everything will come from that. So Sri Guru is the great preacher of Srimad Bhagavatam. The entire Srimad Bhagavatam is guru and disciple from the beginning to the end. It is simply discussions between gurus and disciple, guru and disciple, guru and disciple. So this principle of enlightenment is found there even in the most exalted personalities like Maharaj Parikshit who heard from Shukadeva Goswami and in seven days hearing the powerful message of Srimad Bhagavatam he attained complete perfection. So therefore in the Bhagavatam it is said Krishne Swadhamo Pagate Dharma Gyanadi Bi Saha Kalo Nashtadrisham Esham Pura Narko Uduno Dita Yes, this verse <laughs> this verse is telling us that where the, the sages had asked the question where has Dharma gone now that Sri Krishna has left this planet and then Sutta Goswami says oh that Dharma it is now descending into this world just like the, the sunlight comes and destroys all the darkness and even the mist and the fog completely. So this Srimad Bhagavatam has arisen just like the sun to dissipate all the darkness of ignorance of this Kali Yuga. And those who have lost their vision, Kalo uh, Nasta Drisham, that means that due to the effects of Kali Yuga, they have entered into complete darkness of ignorance. They have no vision, no knowledge, nothing. They will get light from the Srimad Bhagavatam. So Srila Prabhupada traveled across the ocean bringing the actual Srimad Bhagavatam with him. And then when he came and landed in Boston Harbor, he quoted the Srimad Bhagavatam that if people hear this message of yours, then gradually they'll become purified by your mercy and they'll understand and that's exactly what happened to Prabhupada's great wonder and astonishment. They started to come, and by hearing the Maha Mantra from the lips of the pure devotee, by hearing his Harikata, uh, and we have one of them right here, Srimati Shamarani Dini, 
right from the very beginning of Prabhupada's coming, she heard and became a Vaishnava, you see. So all of us are in exactly the same situation. There is no difference. That we've all been here for millions of lives and we're all coming into the association of the pure Vaishnavas and the Srimad Bhagavatam is here for us to hear from. And there are many wonderful sadhus and very exalted Vaishnava personalities. So what great fortune to come into this line coming down from our Gurudev who also preached Srimad Bhagavatam and the essence of Bhagavatam all over the world. So there's no more time left. It is a Kadasi Titi today. Everyone has been uh, fasting and Artik. I don't know, I didn't hear any Artik going on yet. Huh? Okay, so now we will complete our class. I just want to give a chance for just a couple of minutes any questions that anyone wants to ask. Yes, uh, he was talking about no. Someone surrender, surrender to a pure Vaishnava. What happens when guru, guru leaves? How do we choose who is a pure Vaishnava? And what is the side effect of surrendering to the wrong person? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> That's more than one question. I think there's like three questions there. Um, so basically, you're saying that we should hear from a pure Vaishnava. So your first question was, uh, how do we know who to hear from after the disappearance of Sri Guru? Correct? Yes. That was your first question. And then your second question? And the second question is, how do we know who, surrender, who we surrender to? Yeah. And uh, that's actually part of the first question. Yes. And the second is, uh, what are the side effects of surrendering to the wrong person? Okay. <laughs> well, to be very short, you know, it's a different world today than it was, like, say, after my Prabhupada disappeared. It's somewhat different because there are many different Vaishnava groups and many very senior Vaishnavas in the world today. But to meet someone who has topmost realization, very, very rare. You know, when our Guru Dev was departing from this world, the first couple of, the couple of years just before that, you know, he was, it was about two years before he departed, we were in, uh, or maybe it was the same year before he departed. No, it was two years before, 2008. And uh, Guru Dev called us, a few of us, up to his room in uh, Gopinath Bhavan. And it was that, at that time, that he started to suggest to us that the sannyasis should start to initiate. And then there was a whole dialogue that went on, and then later on Kishori Mohan and Sudevi came to Gurudev, Brajanath Prabhu was there, I think, and you know, they were crying from their heart, and they were saying, but, but Gurudev, our, our whole preaching is to repeat your words that you have to hear from the Uttam Mahabhagwat, and now, you know, this other dynamic that you're <laughs> suggesting like that. And Gurudev, he was a little bit stern. And he was saying, don't be so childish like this. He said, he said, then, then what? After me, everything should stop? He said, a guru, he actually told us, a guru like me is very rare in this world. Mm -hmm. And that is a fact. Okay? Now, <laughs> People will be attracted according to their samskaras, according to their past inclinations. They will be attracted here, they will be attracted as we observe, and as we have observed for many, many years. Uh, but if we rely upon the determination of experienced Vaishnavas who have demonstrated in their life uh, consecutively, that they are interested in that quality of pure Vaishnava, you see. And we rely upon them for some direction. That is one way in which we can be helped, especially for younger devotees. Srila Gurudev, he wanted an international movement just like Srila Prabhupada did. At the time when Prabhupada disappeared, as I told yesterday, there was such a personality, more than one. 
but one specific one who was his contemporary eh, and very exalted, Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj, and he specifically told. But did his disciples follow that instruction? This is a very interesting history, even though he directly told this. Later on, they thought they were more intelligent. And they actually did the opposite. At first, they came to him to inquire. But then after some time, because of their anartas, they started to see him as a competitor. So I, there's so much history. And like, you know, I could literally sit here for like one week and tell all of these specific histories that occurred at that time. So anyway, how to determine? We should stay in the association of a more advanced persons who we feel confidence that they're in the level of Madhyam, they have clear, that they're in the line of our Guru Dev. That's a very important thing. They're in the line of our Guru, that they're not deviating, they're not telling you something contrary to Sri Guru's continuously repeated instructions. And that happens. That happens again and again. We just saw it happen this last year. A section of Gurudev's so-called followers started to, pre to preach completely the opposite of what he told about our Srila Prabhupada for the entire time that he was traveling in the whole Western world. You see? And then they started to try to say, we know what his real intentions were and to interpret and misinterpret his words and all of this. So what happens as a result of this? Apasampradaya, deviation from Guru himself. And Srila Sridhar Maharaj and Sri Guru in His Grace clearly describes this. These are the symptoms that what your Guru spoke, it will become gradually absent in those who are trying to become Guru in his place. But they're not actually following him, you see. So, but we're fortunate because we see clearly. And many of the senior devotees, in fact, all of the senior, most of the senior devotees around the world, when this was going on this last year, on Facebook and internet, none of them bought this ridiculous presentation of theirs. None of them. None of this real senior stalwart followers of Srila Gurudev, you see. Only new people and people that uh, can easily be misled. Or people with ulterior motives. So, you know, how to protect oneself. This is a very important topic. How to find real sadhu sangha that will be keep you complete faith in your guru. If there is a person who is a Sikh guru, and you're coming and hearing from him, but he is speaking something that diminishes your faith in your own guru, then he is not a Sikh guru. She looked Bharati Maharaj, Bhakti Vigyan Bharati Maharaj, answered this question when just recently Jagat Mohini Didi asked him this question: uh, How can we know? who we can accept as, as real Sikh Guru after the disappearance of our Guru. So that is the criterion. And he will not try to take your faith that you are giving to your Guru and take it for himself. If he does this, you should go away. You should go away. You see. So, but there are many levels of Vaishnavas and it takes some, you know, sincerity to be able to go through this jungle. But if we have guidance from those who are experienced personalities, and there are such experienced personalities, I'm not going to give a list of names right now, but there are very experienced Vaishnavas in this world who can, we can receive advice from, you see. We can hear Harikata from them. I cannot estimate what is their level because we know that unless someone is on a very exalted level, it is not possible to determine exactly what level. It, oh, this person is in the stage of bhav, and this person is in the stage of asakti. You know, the neophyte devotees, very, very easily, they'll call anyone a Mahabhagavat. You see? This is one of the nature of the neophytes because archayam eva harayay pujam yakshadaye hate 
natan bhaktishu chanyeshu. They can't recognize what levels of bhaktas there are and how to deal with them. So what they do is they do exactly the opposite of what they should be doing. They should honor the Mahabhagwats uh, and recognize them as such and give appropriate respect on the neophyte level to all Vaishnavas according to their level. But what they do is they consider a neophyte to be a Mahabhagwat. We've seen this many times. Many, many times we've seen this. So therefore we should go to experienced Vaishnavas. You know, experienced. They've already had, uh, they've demonstrated in their life that they can recognize Sadguru. And they can recognize, you know, how to approach that personality, how to associate with that personality. So I can definitely say that right here in Jagannath Puri, one such person is sitting and we happen to be going to hear from him in the evenings. Uh, he is a very, very exalted personality. He has very deep realizations of Krishna consciousness. Uh, he is in that category, but I cannot estimate what category. All I can say is that he is Shabde Parecha Nishnatam Brahmani. He has those qualifications, you see. So, an entire class, and I'll read from Srila Sridhar Maharaj's words on this point. How to determine that. How to recognize Sri Guru. What to do after the disappearance of Sri Guru from this world. But we see that naturally people are gravitating towards where they feel that they can find some fulfillment in their heart, they can find uh, some shelter, but not all are going to the correct places. Uh, so therefore we should try to follow those who are experienced, have some advancement in knowledge, in bhakti, and then that is a safer process. But for those who are going, as you asked, to the wrong persons, what will be the result? Uh, Shastra is telling us what is the result. Actually, there are very, very uh, extreme statements that are told in Shastras. For those who are misleading jivas from the actual path of pure bhakti, then they have to, that person who misleads has to suffer hellish punishment as a karmic reaction to this. And those followers also go with him. They will have to. They'll have to get some uh, result. But there's all different levels of results, depending on the motivation of the person. Uh, her hand went up. Just, yeah. Um, the problem, you're saying that we should go to those who are experienced. Which, of course, is correct. The problem is, is that those who have changed what Verde has, says, has said also have the appearance of being experienced. Yeah. So someone might think, well, they're experienced. They were with Verde since such and such a time. Verde never gave any warnings about them. You know, they know. So that's that's the problem, is they also appear to be the experienced. That's people. right. But as I just told, when the situation arises where it becomes obvious that they're not in Guru Dave's line, right. then what happens? Those who are senior and experienced, they, they detect that. Yes. And they say, okay, obeisances to you from a distance. Yes. We don't want your association. You're not giving the line of our Guru Dave. You're not adhering to that. You're misleading everybody away from one of the most critical points that Guru Dave preached about. Oh, I agree with you yeah. 100%. Yeah. On the principle of, of saying to anyone, yeah. you know, go to who's experienced, then they might say, well, they're experienced. So, but that's know. right. So, yeah. In this regard, the instructions of the Guru are not different from the Guru. Yeah. See, Guru and he is no longer physically present. Then we take shelter of all his instructions. And we try to discuss them with each other. And those who help us to follow the instructions, we should associate with them. Yes. Yes. It's simple. Yeah, then very you will simple. feel very happy and inspired. Yeah. Can you repeat? He's saying that 
you know, the instructions of Sri Guru are actually non different than himself. And that is a very important principle. It's called Vani. <coughs> Vani. So in his absence of his Vapu, his physical association, Vani takes this supreme position. And if we see uh, amongst ourselves that there are so many different disciples and true followers of Sri Guru, then we can associate with them in his association. And, and then we also feel the presence of Sri Guru. We're staying in line of Guru. You see, correct? Wherever we find that this, the, the order of Sri Guru, the instructions, the teachings of Sri Guru, means our whole Guru Parampara, but especially that Sri Guru who came in our life and accepted us. His teachings are especially the personal teachings that he has given us, his order, most sacred for us throughout eternity. They are no different from Sri Guru. To be able to discuss that with each other and to go deeper into the teachings, whenever we find that opportunity, that is where we will feel encouragement. And that is where we will feel happy and always yeah, eager to experience yeah, how we can improve ourselves. Gopis are doing the same thing. We are following in their footsteps. They are the ideal. When Krishna is not present, they come together and they discuss how we can make Krishna happy. What does he like? What is his nature? So similarly with Sri Guru Paramahansa. What do they like? What is their inner? What is their manobish? How we can fulfill that? So, Srila Sridhar Maharaj also, he says that we have to learn to detect this divine flow that is coming down in a particular personality. Uh, and like in the absence of Guru, he's talking that this same mood, the same instructions, that same uh, divinity, this, it, will, it can appear in this Vaishnava, or it can appear here or there. And where we detect that flow coming down, uh, then we should run there and honor and pay our obeisances and associate and hear from that personality. And then if we see that it is coming in another person, then we also run there. This is the principle. And even if an entire institution, which we've also historically gone through this experience, an entire institution and leadership have determined the very complete opposite of what Sri Guru has instructed uh, as far as honoring that divine flow coming down, then we will be out of painful necessity, Srila Sridhar Maharaj says, to leave that place. Hmm? So, we have to be so sincere and honest and straightforward in our search for the ultimate, search for Sri Krishna reality, the beautiful, uh, that is our ultimate attainment. And what our Guru has given us, has given us everything that we need to attain that. But if we see that someone is actually averting uh, from the entire pathway, even causing jivas all throughout the world to go in the wrong direction, do we have to follow that? Never. And we may be in the minority, the very tiny minority. Even Srila Sridhar said, you have to be prepared in your quest of the actual truth to stand even alone. If the whole world is on one side and you alone are on the other side, your conviction should be so strong to stand alone and march forward with the banner of one's Gurudev. And those tests may come, they have come. Many of us have gone through that, you see? So, this is the principle uh, that Guru Tattva is not limited to an institution. And it's not limited even to a particular personality. It's not even limited to a disciplic line. But we know what is the line that we are living in. It is the Rupanuga Guru Varga. And those who are following the teachings of Rupa Goswami, actual Rupanuga Gurus, 
we follow them, you see. So that's why our Gurudev, his contribution is so, uh, so indispensable because he demonstrated this. He broadcast this to the entire world of Vaishnavas, even if they didn't want to hear, even if they thought they know better, even if they're trying to defeat him. He didn't let up at all. He went straight forward, giving this treasure of the Rupanuga disciplic succession. And so, we have that legacy, as Brajana said. His instructions are fully present in his books. We can watch, just like we're watching his videos, his audios. And when we are in the association of those who want to stay true to his teachings, we are very fortunate. You know, after Srila Sridhar Maharaj departed, I mean, after Prabhupada departed, and we had to leave the institution, the ISKCON institution, we were forced because we wanted to associate with him. We had to go on for many years, practically alone. Practically alone. And I always thought, oh, if only, you know, there could be a, a, a society of Vaishnavas who are embracing all of these. And Krishna arranged this. Krishna brought Srila Gurudev to the western shores and he created simply from his pure Harikata an entire worldwide family of Vaishnavas all hearing eagerly, enthusiastically trying to follow the conceptions of pure bhakti that he was preaching uh, and he wants this to continue into the future also uh, and he's implanted all these conceptions in the hearts of the devotees so at that point I realized oh I'm not alone anymore There's it was astonishing to me, actually, that uh, now Gurudev is creating a worldwide movement, you know, completely separate. And it's a kind of non-institution in one sense. <laughs> Many people didn't want any other, another institution, but yet, it's a society. It's a society for Sadhu Sangha. And Gurudev also told us, I remember very clearly, Budara told us this, he told us to Budara, when Budara was approaching Gurudev to try to understand what are his desires for after he leaves this world. And Gurudev specifically said, he said, that if there is any pure, proper, bona fide Vaishnava, you should invite them into our assembly. You see? So, we are not with borders and boundaries of institutional limitations. Uh, we have all come for Sadhu Sangha. And we've all come, especially for what Srila Gurudev has been giving. Uh, so if we're real followers, we will follow that and not deviate from the conclusions that he has given. And not try to convince everybody else that Gurudev was not really telling you what he wanted you to hear, but he was tricking you and telling you in a kind of roundabout way, but he wasn't really telling No. You don't interpret his words like this. You don't have the right. You, no one has the right to interpret Shri Guru's words, especially after he has departed from this world. And the most telltale sign is that they had five years to approach him personally, which they didn't do. And then after, then they start trying to tell the whole world, actually, we know what Gurudev was really saying, but you didn't all understand it. He was cheating everybody. No, this is bogus. These persons cannot be considered disciples and followers of Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj or any pure Vaishnava if they deviate from his instructions. This is why our Gurudev, he began to give initiation to so many disciples of this other institution which was started by Srila Prabhupada. Uh, he started to give initiation to their disciples who lost faith in them and came to his lotus feet. Why? because he considered them to have fully deviated from the instructions of Prabhupada, you see. So we have to be very clear in our march forward uh, to clearly understand what Sri Guru has given us. And <laughs> Srila Sridhar Maharaj explains, many tests will come. And these are coming from Krishna. And as you say, the Lord is very yes. happy. Yeah. When any obstacle comes, he becomes more happy. Yes. Then he can glorify his Guru. Yes. Yeah. And that test, Srila Srinivar says, it is necessary because you have to examine in your own self what have I really understood of my Guru's teachings? Have I really 
penetrated deeply and understood them, or have I only understood superficially? That test will come by Krishna's arrangement to help us. You have to be purified, otherwise when you are not pure, you give the diluted thing to others. That is correct. Yes. Gaur Premanande, Srila Gurudeva Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Sri Rupa Nuga Guru Varga Ki Jai, Sachinandan Gaur Hari Ki Jai, Amavita Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai, Nitai Gaur Premanande, Hari Hari Bol, Vansha Kalpata Rubascha, Kripa Sindhu Vecha, Patita Nam Pavadi Pyo Vaishnavi Pyo Namodha. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare 